Everybody. Welcome to the Mile High Mentors Podcast. My name is Connor Doobie, your host each and every episode. Very much appreciate you tuning in, whether this is your very first time listening or you've listened to all 11 episodes already, which is incredible. This is our going on to our 12th episode. It's been incredible so far and we are just getting ready for Turkey Day probably listening to this after Turkey Day, but it is late November now and uh, very excited to stuff my face this week. So today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Active Blogs, which has been a business-to-business marketing agency. They've been around 18 years. Be sure to go check them out at activeblogs.com and you can receive a no-cost expert marketing consultation. We're also brought to you by Denver Open Media. Definitely give those guys a uh, uh, check them out at denveropenmedia.org because they're a great nonprofit here in Denver. They do media training. They provide tools. They provide resources. They provide the space uh, to to, uh, produce great media content just like this podcast. And uh, so be sure to check them out. Today's guest is an awesome, awesome lady. Her name is Patrice Barber, and she is now the current president of Tie the Rockies, which is the world's largest entrepreneurial organization. It's a nonprofit, a huge global community, and they have a lot of great resources for entrepreneurs. So she's a president. She has traveled all over the world, lived in the Middle East for uh, the very beginning of her childhood, came back to the States, earned an engineering degree, earned engineering degree. If I could talk, that would be great. I guess I'm just salivating over all this turkey that's going to go down this week. Uh, and uh, she's had an incredible entrepreneurial story, which i I can't wait to share with you guys. She's worked and she's founded over six companies, sold a couple of them off, had some great success with some, some not so great successes with others. And she just has so much insight and information and value to share with everybody. So without further ado, please introduce Patrice. Barbara, I'd like to introduce you Introduce to you, Patrice Barber, to the Mile High Mentors Podcast. And you have four kids have, yourself, don't you? I have two kids. Oh, you have two kids, okay. I saw I your three, Facebook picture or whatever. Uh, but. I have um, two sons, and then I'm uh, one of four. Uh-huh. Yeah. My brothers and sisters are all 10, 12, and 13 years older. So, Oh, really? Mm. So you're the youngest of all of them? I'm a baby of the so family. Right. And yeah, we, we'll just roll into it. Okay. Yeah, Three, yeah. two. Cool. And we're live. And go ahead. Finish your story. So uh, one of four, and uh, my oldest uh, brother is off to college by the time I'm eight years old, right? So yeah. So you get to be the baby of the family, <laughs> and you get to be the um, only child for a period of time. And I too. know as the older sibling myself... You knew I'm spoiled. Right? I know you're spoiled. Right? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Right. Like you my, get away. You got away with everything, oh, didn't yes, you? I did. Yes. Something tells me you still do. I do. Like <laughs> no is not part of the vocabulary. No, you may not have that really. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's that's why you're sitting here today. Exactly. Actually, and you and, get away with a lot of stuff, and you just learn. Oh, you can. Yeah. Yes, I can. Yeah. yeah. Well, and thank you for joining the podcast. By the way, I'm so we're thank very you, grateful to have here. you here. Yeah, super excited, great. up and rolling, and um, and you drove down from Boulder today, did you not? I did. Yeah. Yep. One of the companies that I work with um, uh-huh. uh, is up there. Quist Valuation. Mm. 
doing some rock and fun stuff that really um, actually helps to support the entrepreneurial community as well. Yeah. Um, as companies get ready for merger acquisition, they get ready for Series A funding, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I get to work with them and help them figure out strategies on product rollout and all kinds of fun things. Yeah. So I definitely want to get into that. First things first, let's start like back, back. And uh, you already know because I did the same thing to Ash and made him go way back to the to back in India and all that good stuff. Tell me, what was your childhood like? Where did you grow up? Where were you born? All that fun stuff. All that fun stuff. Yeah. So, um, born in Texas, mm-hmm. Southeast Texas, and at the age of three, my family um, and I moved to Kuwait. So we lived there for about five years. So wow. my second language is Arabic. Wow. And uh, But it's only street Arabic. So when why, I speak... Why Kuwait? Why did they move to Kuwait? Oil. Okay. So my dad was uh, an industrial engineer and heavily into the refining process uh-huh. for um, modifying the petrochemical products that come out of the ground in right there on site in Kuwait, the Kuwait National Petroleum Company. Um, so he was uh, there to help teach them how to do the um, refining process. And then after about five years there, we moved to Saudi Arabia um, with uh, Aramco. You may have heard of that in Dahran. And then um, moved to Lebanon for a couple of years. Wow. Yeah, seven different countries. Wow. And uh, started speaking French while I was there in Lebanon because everybody speaks French. In and, Lebanon? Yeah, French and Arabic. It's very much. Uh, really? Yes. Hmm. Very fun. I'm sure country. most people don't know that. Maybe not. Do most people seem surprised? Uh, no, not usually. Huh. Most people. Um, Maybe I'm so just it's it's known it as the Paris of the Middle East. Wow. Yeah, it's very cosmopolitan, and um, uh, they have a beautiful beach there, and the, called the Corniche, and you can go, you know, sunbathing and swimming in the afternoon. Yeah. In the morning, you go skiing in the mountains. So yeah, it's really a fun place to live. Um, and then uh, wars came, and we fled, and we went to Iran for a while, uh, for about a year. And then when was this? What year yeah, was this? right in the seventies, right before the, the Shah 70s? then became uh, <laughs> deposed. Not very long after that, wow. <laughs> so we were there in tumultuous times, but you know it doesn't really change. Yeah, interestingly, it doesn't. It doesn't actually change people. Uh, people just yeah keep on every about ten years Lebanon seems to go through a cycle and yeah upheaval. So which and one then, was your favorite out of all of them? Um, you know, in the Middle East, I um, I really enjoyed Lebanon. Really? Yeah, the people there with the mixture of Christianity and Islam and um, the Druids that are there, uh, people really learn to actually get along quite nicely with each other. It's a very small country and a very small space. Uh-huh. So, but people learn to get along. Quite, Is it very quite tech well. modern? Like. You know, and now it, I'm ignorant about it that. is a bit more than Lebanon. most places. Yes, it's uh-huh. a fairly modern, um, you know, country mm-hmm. um, as the Middle East goes. I would say probably Dubai and some places like that are further ahead because they have a lot more money. Mm-hmm. So money tends to get you there. Yeah. But um, so... So, yeah, and then we moved to Belgium, and then finally France and came back. My dad said, okay, I think you need to learn the Pledge of Allegiance <laughs> and uh, a few things about the United States. And uh, given you might think about going to college there, uh-huh. we'd like you to stay in the States for college. <laughs> so, so we came back to Texas. Man, and, then and what, what age YouTube. were you at this point? Um, for high school. Oh, so you yeah. started like freshman year of high school Pretty back much. in Texas? Yes. Wow. Culture shock? Uh, probably yes. a little bit. Yes. Oh my god. And when you go, you uh, know, when you're around fo- in foreign countries for a long time, and you hear all the different languages, that's and then, right. And then you understand everyone's conversations, right? Yes. Yeah. That's but you can speak fine. fluent Arabic then. Um, I don't speak fluently anymore. Uh-huh. Uh, when I was younger, I did, and um, my French is much better than my Arabic, and mm-hmm. German is in the mix. And when I went to work for Texas Instruments for a few years, yeah. um, for about five years in semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, they allowed us to take Japanese, so I um, studied Japanese so that I could manage some of the um, programs that we were implementing in Japan, in Hato, Japan. So yeah. it helps when you know the language and the culture. That's amazing. So, yeah, that's the background. Uh-huh. So from high school, you went off, and, and, and so so your dad was an engineer. Yep. Was your mom a, a she homemaker home. at this yep. point? Yep. Okay. Yeah, she ran... Yeah, an amazing amount of things. She's a lot of with all your older brothers stuff. were with you that whole time. No, too? by the time I was eight and they were eighteen, they were all back in the states for college. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, okay, it's the very only child kind of environment. Um, uh-huh. They would come like once or twice a year. It's expensive to go around the world, have yeah. to go around the world to travel. 
to visit. A little bit. And, yeah. Yeah. Not like you can drive you in, across country. Right. So, but in the 70s, maybe a little better? That was, je- that was the jet set days. Yeah? Yeah. Gotcha. 70s and 80s, it was definitely jet setter times. And you, yeah, we flew first class and oh, whew, it was, those were nice times. And I'm sorry, who was your dad working for? This? Several different companies. Okay, um, gotcha. We went overseas initially with Kuwait National Petroleum Company. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. So then, yeah, University of Texas, uh, four years at UT um, in Austin, studying yeah. engineer, taking and following my dad's footsteps. At the time, I didn't know he was an industrial engineer. I just knew he was an engineer. Yeah. But I know sometimes, I don't know how kids miss these things. I know and my own I was own wondering sons. about that, too, because you're a marketing salesperson. Right. Like, how does that connect? But you went to engin- like you went all the way. You graduated oh, yeah, yeah. as an engineer? Yeah, yeah That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Four years in mechanical engineering, so I have a minor That's in mechanical. A and, and then my fifth year industrial. Yeah, it is. I just did marketing. You just. Or like a degree in That's common sense is what fine, I yeah. call it. <laughs> That's a perfectly fine thing. Right. Not adjust. It's a good thing. Yeah. Well, people need that creative. Yeah, energy. but if you are, if you can... Go for engineering and have a sales marketing mentality. That's like a double. That's like a a double whammy. Yeah, yeah. big time. Yeah, it's an interesting mix. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, and I did engineering, um, process engineering for the first probably third of my career, and then jumped into um, into the entrepreneurial world, and then really decided that I, I preferred smaller companies to really large corporate with mm-hmm. all the politics that go along and all yeah. those fun things. Is that because? Is that why, because of all the politics you faced? You know, the reason I jumped into my first company was actually, um, it was, as so often is the case, more of a happening. Mm -hmm. Um, I was at Texas Instruments, had been there about five years on one of their fast tracks um, into management. As a young whippersnapper, you kind of don't know what you don't know. You don't know that um, that's actually a really cool thing. You Mm -hmm. think, oh, well, it's pretty much everybody's doing these same kind of things. You don't realize it. And I have, as is common in TI, Texas Instruments, they have um, dual reporting structures and a parallel organizational structure. It's very cool and uh, and somewhat complex. But I poured it into the director of finance for the department as well as the IT mm-hmm. uh, because I did a lot of projects coming out of college with an engineering background and computer background in the time. It was very unique. And as a semiconductor manufacturing, you think, gosh, they don't, they should know all about computers. They were just implementing computers in their manufacturing facilities really? to run their processes. Uh-huh. It was the all logistic. by manual books. Oh. It was books that were passed around to say Ex- the instructions <laughs> and the yeah. testing was all with these notebooks. And of course, that's a lot of particulates and it kills your scrap rate um, of your semiconductors that you're manufacturing on these little disks. So we decided, okay, we're going to put computers in here and cut that scrap out. And so you got the fun task of I got taking the, the data and putting it. Oh, no, I ran the entire project. Yeah. A Fully implementing and saying, okay, I have to train on it. It's 24-7 operation. So go in there and train those people. These are um, mainly a lot of black women who were undegreed, high school education, mm-hmm. GED, um, a few black males, and then some white males and females, but predominantly um, black women in there about, oh, 35 to 50-year-olds. Mm-hmm. And I'm in there as a young 25-year-old whippersnapper going, okay, you report to me, and yeah. we're going to get this done. <laughs> and they're right. Yeah. Uh, but I was really Because um, nobody humbled. tells me no. Well, you know, that's true, but I was very uh, quick to recognize that they knew a lot more than I did. Yeah. So I asked a lot of questions, and they knew exactly how it should be done and the fastest way and the most efficient way. So all I had to do was ask the questions, and they would tell me, oh, well, we should do this now. Oh, brilliant. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was there to kind of help um, the only female supervisor in an all-male you know, supervisor, director level. and it's very male-dominated oh, industry. Yes. In yeah. Texas. Do you know Jill Tejan, by the way? The name's very familiar. She's like major, major player in the STEM community. Oh, fun. Here, yeah, yeah. yeah. You guys should, if you don't know each meet. other. I got it. She was on our se- very second episode. Awesome. Yeah, you guys would get along very yeah, well. Yeah, so it was, it was a lot it. of fun. Um, I had to stand up for them a lot. Uh, they got dissed by HR and all kinds of stuff. I had to f- go fight for their raises for them. I'm like, no, just because it's women. Dissed by HR because they're all women in there? They're, I don't know what their issue was. Uh-huh. I honestly don't, and I just didn't really at the time care. I'm like, uh, no, uh-huh. these guys all got their raises, so guess right. what? These women, you, you need to explain to me how I'm going to tell them that they can't have their raise. And so they loved me. The women did. So we did a fantastic job of making that run very smoothly. And then after about five years, a lot of different projects and things, all pretty much process focused, um, Mm -hmm. process re-engineering and business process. Um, One of my uh, cohorts there, his name was on the list for a RIF. 
And he was my boss. Um, on this side, and a I also worked a uh, reduction in force. Oh, okay. So there was oh. a big layoff coming. But yeah. I was in the finance department, so I was privy to all that information. And he was on the IT side, and whom I reported to over there, and he didn't know. So I went to my finance director and said, "You know what? Here's the thing. He's got family. He's got you know little kids and a mortgage, and he loves it here. And how about we take my name and put my name on there, and I'll take my smaller severance package, and you can let him stay here, and I." Well, go do other fun things because, frankly, Dallas was not my favorite place. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so you were pl- you are planning on getting out of there anyway. I was, yeah. exactly. And the like, opportunity I'm putting presented. in my two weeks' notice well, I didn't, in a I didn't, roundabout yeah, kind of way, exactly. I guess. <laughs> I'm like, you know what? Let's do a really cool thing for him. And I never told him. And, um, and then I just ended up moving to Colorado mm-hmm. and started my first company at 29. And um, have so my this first was about client. 28 or yeah, 27 20, by the time 29. You there. Okay, mm-hmm. so you worked there for six, seven years? Five years. So? Five years? Yeah, okay. five, five and a half years. Gotcha. And then moved to Colorado. Why Colorado? You know, um, love the lifestyle here. When you live all over the entire world and you travel all the time, you kind of get to see the very best of everything. And mm-hmm. then you kind of go, oh, wow, what do I really like? What do I really enjoy? And I just love um, the sense of community in Colorado. I think it's really, really strong. Um, I love the outdoor scene. I'm a big, avid, I climb 14ers, two of them every summer, bring my sons along since they were yay high. And yeah. now now they run up the mountain with me and they're like, you're too slow, mom. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have a lot of fun with that and mountain yeah. biking. And um, this summer we were out uh, water skiing. And you know, so we spend a lot of time outdoors. Uh-huh. And then, you know, if it snows, we're on the golf course, uh, cross country skiing on the course. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, we just have a lot of fun with it. That's awesome. Um, so so, uh, Colorado, just the lifestyle here. And how have you been here before you? Yeah, I had in high school, I had come several times with friends to go skiing in Winter Park and mm-hmm. love that experience, of course. And um, so I just thought, you know, out of all the, and I'd been to California a bunch, I've been in New York and all the, you know, Florida and all it's, that. It's hard to, it's hard to be. It's a hard place it's to be. It's a really great, awesome state. So it's right in the hub. It is. Everything. And there's so. just so much. Um, there is so much entrepreneurial stuff going on. You yeah, know, people that want to make a difference, that want to give back to the community, uh, which is just resonates with me because that's kind of how my mom and dad brought me up. Um, when we were overseas, my mom, while she did it work. She was very philanthropic and uh, spent a lot of time uh, helping rescue women who were in Arabic, you know, countries in marriages that were, you know, they were very poorly, you know, treated. Right. Not everybody like is, mar- but... They're all, mostly all forced um, marriages. No, I wouldn't there. say that. They're arranged. Arranged. I mean, they're arranged, yeah. but... Um, What's the difference uh, <laughs> between a There is a definite difference. Is there? Okay. There yeah. is, yeah. Okay. Maybe yeah. I'm just being a little like, too crude we, we all think that that's such a oh, old-fashioned and not such a great idea, but you'd be surprised how accurate parents are at actually assessing, like, oh, I think you would actually get along with this person and be good friends as well as, you know, uh-huh. make a great partnership. So right. it's not all that terrible but at any rate she um definitely we we would help women get out of those situations and some of them to get out of the country it was kind of the underground railroad going on with my mom yeah (laughs) so wow so you know you learn at that early on Uh uh, and how did she stuff and get involved in that through the through church um we that was the first thing we ever did in a country was uh go find the church you know, mm-hmm. you get to the country, within one or two weeks, you find the church because that is a community where, you know, you can count on um, expatriates and others, not always expatriates, but oftentimes mm-hmm. that's the case. And you're the only white face in a very dark crowd. You can understand these yeah. things. <laughs> so it's um, it's something that you learn to do. And in that community, they, they were always doing community outreach, you know, from the church to help. Mm-hmm. So. So that's kind of how that got started. And so it was kind of bred into me early on. You know, you need to be contributing and adding value to the community. So get to Colorado and go live uh, up in the mountains within a year. Because I said to myself, if I'm going to live in Colorado, I'm living in the mountains. Like, uh-huh. you can live in any city anyway. So you didn't start in Boulder. You were in a mountain town? Uh, yeah, I was in Indian uh-huh. Hills. Okay. And so I started in on the fire department. Where is Indian Hills? It's uh, out uh, 285. Okay, so it's not like it's in the foothills. Oh, okay, gotcha, like, gotcha. Um, Morrison, you know, oh, okay. Red Rocks, yeah, is? Yeah, 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 right down the road. I know Red, Red Rocks. Rocks. Yes, <laughs> hopefully <laughs> that's where it's at. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. so I moved there and ha- had a great cabin and made a killing on it when I sold uh-huh. it a few Who's years we later. At this point, um, just myself. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, and then um, 
uh, after the first company, you know, got it launched and had a client within the first year, mm-hmm. thought I knew what I was doing, you know, so often. We just go off and we do things. We're too stupid to know what we don't know, right? Right. And so uh, went along for several years and then realized, oh, gosh, it's getting a little harder. And I have no idea about this thing called marketing and sales, like clueless. <laughs> So, what was your first business? Um, consulting services for implementing um, enterprise level software like Oracle okay. Financials, SAP, ERP systems. Mm-hmm. Um, I would work with companies like MCI and Quest, and um, uh, which US West at the time and then became Quest. And they were both clients of mine um, subsequently. Um, Intel, those were all clients of mine where I'd go in, talk with their executive team. They'd say, yep, we got these problems. I'd say, okay, here's some you know vendors out there. Bring the vendors in, coordinate the, the um, reviews and demos and all of the different criteria we'd use to grade them. And then they'd pick their vendor solution and then I'd oversee that entire project, which is usually a multi-year project, you know, Minimum one, oftentimes one and a half, two years. And mm-hmm. eventually when you learn to bring them in within 10% of budget, and it's, you know, multi-hundred dollars, hundred thousand dollars to million dollar projects. They're pretty happy with you. They're pretty happy about that. <laughs> yeah. And you get it in on time, like within 30 days, plus or minus. Yeah. On a year and a half long thing, a year, you know, and a quarter, they're like, ooh, okay. Was this just on your own or you had a team? So I would always pull the team together. Okay, gotcha. But it depended on which software it uh-huh. was as to which team would be the expert team that would be able to do their implementation. So okay, had, cool. You know, so you're like the software. Avengers of software implementation. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Go in there. Or have DC. Fun. Mar- DC. You know, which are, wait, what are they called? The Justice League. That's Justice that's the League. League. There yeah. we go. <laughs> so that's what I started out doing, and, uh-huh. then, and I had clients that I would I would travel around and all over the U.S. But um, okay, uh, how did you get business? That's at that the point? thing. When you're how? really good, people just keep referring. So yeah. I would be done with one project, and then the next one would just sort of magically appear. And I'm like, oh, okay, I guess this is how this works. Mm -hmm. And then eventually the economy didn't, you know, hold out. And so you go, oh, wow, I guess I have to actually learn how to do this sales and marketing thing. Um, So I I stepped into another position where it was a VP of, um, of of a firm that, produced the software for managing uh, project management. Okay, gotcha. And then they eventually were acquired, um, and I helped to get them from about $5 million to $10 million in revenue, so small uh-huh. companies. Is were they local much. here? And they were actually based out of uh, California. Okay, gotcha. Uh, Bay Area, San Francisco, but I was handling the region here, Western mm-hmm. region, and so got to learn how you actually do a little bit of sales and marketing and then decided that the travel that they talked about and what I was doing was not going to work. Uh-huh. So no more travel for me because uh, that was like... They're sending you to clients all, all over. over yes. yeah, all over the world or No, US mostly days. the U.S., um, uh-huh. yeah, but it was Monday through Friday. Right. <laughs> you know, come home, do your dry cleaning, and get on the plane again. <laughs> so I was quite the road warrior, so no. Yeah. He said, uh, I came to Colorado to be in Colorado. <laughs> and how long were you with them for? Oh, a short time, about a year and a half. Uh-huh. And I'm you worked with remote at, uh, with them? More or less. I mean, you travel all the time, so you're in different right. places all over the place. So. And roughly when was this? What year was this? Oh, 90s. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, mid nineties. Okay, gotcha. Three ish, ninety four. Okay, gotcha. And then came back to the to Colorado, and um, and I was uh, working with another another company here, and then had someone approach me to be a uh, one of our clients, asked me to come be a partner, and uh, around in two thousand um, one, stepped into the financial services industry, and then um, ended up selling that company uh, to a couple of well, we had two parts to the company, so mm-hmm. two sort of divisions and two different partners, and ended up selling those. And those took those to, um, one of those we went to over $5 million in about 18 months. Wow. So it was, yeah, it was really That's fun. incredible. How did you guys scale like that? Um, a lot of hustle. <laughs> you? Call, yeah. was, were you direct uh, so, sales? Or? No, actually, I was ops. Mm-hmm. I was COO. And, oh, okay. And uh, my partner was CEO, and, he, and this was financial services, mm-hmm. specifically around insurance sales and mortgage sales and things like that. And we actually had a, a line, a uh, warehouse line, mm-hmm. uh, which means that you bring your loans in, and then you hold them for a certain period, and you have this huge risk of if somebody doesn't buy them, well, then you're servicing. And yeah. that's yeah, and your the cash flow is very right. tricky in that. So, um, so at any rate, we did really well with it because at the time it was right before you know two thousand one to two thousand eight ish was a time of of great fun in that marketplace. Oh, absolutely, we were selling like you know, <laughs> right hot cakes, hot cakes right, <laughs> and some of that was really hot. In but, your early days, like yeah. when you first started your business, if you had to go back 
at this point, what, what were the top three biggest mistakes you made as an early entrepreneur? Oh, um, I think the, the biggest mistake that I made was the assumption that I wouldn't need or didn't need to uh, understand how the process of sales or marketing mm-hmm. and that that would be okay. So that was probably like huge mistake number one. Um, and why did you feel that way at that point? Well, eventually you figure out you, you can't grow and your pipeline does eventually dwindle off mm-hmm. it, it, with the cycles of economy. And so you can't sustain. So you figure out, okay, that, that's kind of key. And normally most people going into um, a new business, starting it up, they spend a lot of time on selling. Mm-hmm. They do. But um, in the case of uh, service-based companies, if you have – good connections before you ever jump out to launch your own thing. Um, it's deceivingly easy. You don't have a lot of overhead and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of easy. Yeah. So and, you, and so like you sell, you service a client. Exactly. Your pipeline's dry. You go out, yeah, you sell. Yeah. You mm-hmm. serve, yeah. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. And you don't, yeah. And you don't do that much selling really. It's more like, oh, well, how can I help you? And if I can, great. And you uh-huh. know, so it's a, which is a good thing. You learn those skills, but then you don't actually know that it's a real process and a real way of actually doing what I would consider the correct way of selling is right. what, what's the value I can bring to you. If I can help you, great. If I can't help you, that's okay. I got somebody else who can probably solve that problem too. So let's have you talk to them. It doesn't matter whether I get that deal or not. Mm-hmm. And when you re- learn to remove yourself um, from that situation of needing it and you let go of the outcome, that's the other second huge lesson. Uh-huh. So let go of the outcome. Like, don't get attached. Really? Yeah. Life just flows so much better when you are not grabbing hold with both yeah. hands. It must happen this way, my way. You know? Just like, go with the flow. Yeah, just like relax about that just a little bit. Uh-huh. If you're a type A person, to be successful, you kind of got to be type A. And so it's this oxymoron situation of, gosh, I need to be like this, but I need to relax a bit. So yeah, what would you categorize yourself more as? Oh, super type like, A. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Interesting. So so, what do you wish you knew about sales and marketing before I got back, going? Yeah. Like back um, then. do you think you would that would still be like relevant? Well, what you did then and what you do now is very very different. Mm-hmm. So um, in two thousand seven two thousand eight timeframe, uh, I got into the entrepreneurial space and I went to a conference. Uh, the, it was a summit in Chicago, snowstorm in Denver, last plane out to get to, to, um, to uh, Chicago. It's crazy. For the whole weekend, we were up at 6 a.m. and we would stay up till 2 in the morning, just like in intense stuff about all about the Internet. Mm-hmm. And at that point, the Internet was kind of just becoming a, a thing out in the real world. Right. Um, and people were, you know, Yahoo was just getting going and all of that. So it was just kind of in a neon state. Um, and people were adopting stuff. And we were talking mm-hmm. about mobile marketing. Like people didn't even, not even half the population had smartphones. They were on feature phones. Right. And we're talking mobile marketing Who's with we? smartphones. Who? All Who's these people the... at this conference. That yeah. Like the gurus. And wow. The, yeah. Yeah. At the this beginning. Early on, huh? Oh, yes. We're at the beginning. And I'm sure even today we're probably talking about stuff that people are like, Nah, and then like five years from now, it's going to be like the thing, the thing, absolutely, yeah. like yes. VR. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I saw this absolutely. great. I follow these people on and Instagram, Bitcoin. like, and I'm sure well, that's going well, somewhere. Oh man, uh, <laughs> it's going. <laughs> you are literally, you are literally the probably the third or fourth guest that's mentioned Bitcoin on the show, oh, and I keep like. I keep brushing it away. No, I'm like, all right, it. all right. Anyway. We'll talk about that one. I guess I'm going to be but, the most knowledgeable Bitcoin person by like the end time I'm done with this thing. But, um, well, you can come listen. There's uh, actually some great presenters that we've got um, who are in the middle of that. Yeah, you can definitely come and listen to them. They're going to be doing some presentations. Well, you're in the meat of Rockies. Yeah, you're in the meat of it with all the companies that you work with and your mm-hmm. accelerators and stuff like exactly. that. Exactly, and you see the coolest technology stuff come through there. I mean, yeah, I a lot this, of it doesn't yeah. make it, but the ideas are brilliant. You know, just great ideas. Yeah. Well, I saw this mm-hmm. AR thing on. In, I follow this technology company on Instagram, mm-hmm. and they literally through your smartphone opens a portal to another like 360 VR world that you can cool. you literally step through the portal with your smartphone and then you can look through the other end of the portal like say the portal's right here we would walk through the portal and we can look back and see the entire studio and everything like that awesome it just blew my mind yep 
My son was showing me something like that, too. That's crazy. So I love crazy. it. It's great. Yeah. It's great stuff. But, yeah, there's definitely something with that. Yeah. It's going to go somewhere big. Yeah. Where, where, where were we on right before that, though? Oh, the conference. And yeah, you I was guys there. Were, you guys were doing, on, like, mobile. Yeah, we were way ahead of the curve because these were all the leaders in the space and Internet marketing, e-commerce, and all that mm-hmm. not being even done, really, and certainly not done well. And SEO, we were discussing all of that and how this yeah. was going to work. And these guys were talking with Google at the time, so they knew the inner workings of the algorithms to the extent that you can without actually being in working for. Well, how many billionaires were created just by doing no, SEO that. in the early oh, days? Oh, absolutely, or right. Yeah. Multi- heck and millionaires. That was, the, that was the allure, right? Mm-hmm. People would see these great videos of them in their posh, you know, this is where I work. I'm on the beach and I'm here <laughs> and there. And people would want that. I want that life. Yeah. It's much, much harder than people think. Yeah. To do e-commerce. And it always has been. It's just that they happen to fall into some great partnerships. And if I've got a list and you've got a list and that list required is 10,000, that's the magic number. If you got a list of 10,000, you You're can good. do e-commerce. If you do not have that list, you better work till you get the list because you are not going to make it. Right. It's just a thing. It's a number. So yeah. all that stuff, we were just kind of in it. And then I decided my business that's very traditional – uh, working with entrepreneurs and how to start up companies, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we're going to take it internet. Well, we're going to do e-commerce in one year. I am stopping all networking face-to-face. I am stopping everything face-to-face. Yeah. And we went and we did it. And we were we were an international um, in within 12 months. And, wow. Yeah, grew that company quite nicely. This was, your, this was your company? Yeah, it was one of the And what were you selling on e-commerce? <laughs> um, we, were, we were selling info products. Oh, right? okay. So we would sell um, how do you get started in a business, and it's in a box. And you come online, and you purchase it, and you get your modules with your videos and your materials that you download, and you get an instructor that you have a little bit of coaching time with, mm-hmm. and... Um, some reviews behind the scenes of your financials and your this and that and the other to put those five pillars of your company in place. Mm -hmm. So it worked great. It was wonderful. But we kept attracting kind of the wrong, the the people that were not really serious. Yeah. They weren't really ready to invest enough time and energy into it. They kind of wanted to stay small so you can't have great successes. Right. And so the success stories didn't come out of it. like the agency type or the marketing chicken and the egg. Yes. You know, where do I put the money? Right, right, What's right. the ROI of this stuff? Yeah. So you were so kind of like hard. an agency then, like well, an at early, that point, it was Well, um, at that point, it wasn't really marketing. It was selling how do you start a business and selling all okay. of the co- so it was consulting one services. Product. Yes, gotcha. there was core product there. Um, and that was a spinoff from the prior company that uh-huh. had been sold, but we pulled that piece off okay, and then gotcha. launched the e-commerce piece of it and then afterwards um you know we couldn't get enough traction and we recognized the thing that they kept wanting was sales and marketing you know and specifically digital marketing we don't get mm-hmm. this digital thing and you could teach them all day long but understanding how to use those tools it just it's just um it's complicated can you believe i still talk to companies today that don't don't yeah believe they There's should a be lot. using sh- linkedin or using facebook or I using do hear that. or shockingly i am with you i hear that too it's amazing. It blows my mind. Yep. We're all relationship-based, and nobody looks for my stuff on the internet. Yeah. I'm like, really? Let me show you some stats that will blow your mind about your competition who is on the internet, and here's how many people are looking for them. And the buying process. Yes. 80% Their percent now, like great. 80% of the buying process is done. On the internet in, first. Yeah. Yes. 100%. They will search everything. And recruiting. Every recruiter mm-hmm. uses LinkedIn oh, to find yeah. out who you are first and checks your Facebook page and, and, and. So, yes, it, we, yeah, we were in a little revolutionary period um, on the, you know, kind of the forefront of that whole curve of e-commerce. Uh-huh. And so what we recognize was you have to do it for them. It's not a do-it-yourself kind of a thing for most people. Right. They're great at what they produce, you know, their widget, their thing, their product, mm-hmm. their service. Um, but they just couldn't get that marketing. So we launched the do-it-yourself part of the business and then that was the third one that I sold mm-hmm. to launcher like those to another agency well it was that. it was the geared towards itself. small um, you know as a, a product that was um, product and service integrated where mm-hmm. we would deliver a consistent amount of social media email marketing um, search engine optimization pay-per-click campaigns you know X number per month all very quantifiable and we put them onto a platform where all of that could be measured and so that was the sticky factor we had annual gotcha. contracts with you know monthly payment option but it's annual contracts and that's not so difficult to sell that when you can right. show those books to somebody else and say hey here's what we got so what were some of your core client base at this 
point. All time small, for that business. All, small all small clients. Yeah, and this yes. was your second was company, the, right? It was actually my sixth company. Oh, um, this was your sixth yep, company. Yep, and gotcha. I sold, it, but it's only the third one that I sold. Oh, okay, gotcha. One of them I had to just close the doors on and walk away. Oh, really? Like, okay, we're done. Really? Yeah, oh. you have to. Yeah. Why, now, why do you have to do that? Let's talk about that. Oh gosh, um, you know you. It, uh, that's where you don't get traction in what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And at some point, you have to have rules in place. As an entrepreneur, you have to make sure that you have financial rules in place that say, if I get to this point by this time and I haven't gotten X amount of you know measurable goals, like mm-hmm. number of clients, amount of revenue, profit margins, things like that, um, if you don't have those rules in place, it's really, really easy to end up with a huge net operating loss. And yeah, I resemble those remarks. So mm-hmm. did did that big mistake, and you're asking about the three, and that would be the third one is really what um, you know putting rules in place that I, I had to write them down because you get to a point where you're like, well, maybe I could bend a little bit here and there. So I just had to write them down, and once a year you go back in and you look at, okay, what was my goal? What was the plan? Where are we at now? Are we there? Do we need mm-hmm. to continue? Do we not need to continue? So that one was like, no. Yeah. So. Do you think a lot of entrepreneurs don't recognize when that timing comes and they it's end up sucked into the hole hard. of that it stuff? It's very hard. It's very hard. Entrepreneurs have a tough time with that of figuring out do we, how do we go get extra financing and help you know, versus draining my entire savings account. And that's, right. that's a huge, huge mistake that can easily be made um, of draining all your own you know, resources and then – having nothing, you know, and then you're trying to still build a business and, and then try try to go, go get money at that point, that's really challenging. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, rule number one is making sure that you keep your reserves and then figure out ways to come up with funding. And mm-hmm. for women entrepreneurs, that's particularly difficult. It's a huge hurdle. Um, they're just not, not viewed as a great um, uh, uh, low risk. But in fact, women's um, organizations uh, entrepreneurial endeavors are far more successful frequently successful than men so really yeah yeah and what do you think, interesting what do you stats think that on is? that um, I think women are actually less uh, in, in as t- in terms of risk taking mm-hmm. they're much uh, less interested in taking big risk mm-hmm. and men are more bold about that and they'll take a big risk do you think so that they can pride go thing, big too. yeah you do know you think that pride problems. thing though will keep, keep a man from like I do think I need to close pride. the doors on this particular right yeah venture opportunity I do think pride would, can get there yeah a woman and would be more to like let that go and that's stuff right like that. yeah I do mm-hmm. think um, what I've seen of women entrepreneurs they, they have to be bold as well but they're more um, uh, have a lot more strength to them and mm-hmm. tenacity, um, whereas men have more of a, a brash boldness. Like, I'm just going to go in there and I'm going to kill it and I'm going to do it. And, and it's true, and they do. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, why um, so few women's, uh, women-owned businesses make it big. Mm-hmm. You know, if They make it, but they don't make it they, like Yeah, they don't make multi-millions and billions. That's right. very, very rare. You know, So if you're, you're in the top 3% of women-owned businesses, if you're over a million in revenue, Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, huh. And that's not a big number, really, you know. In it's the not. scheme of things. No, not at it's all. It's just not a big number, but that's kind of, you know, the facts of it. Yeah. And so. Wow. That's really interesting. So, yeah. Okay. So, so the you sold off three. Yeah. And, and I you, said, no more. And you dumped off three. You went yeah, 50, Well, 50 one of them almost. hangs in there. It's a holding company, so. Uh-huh. And one of them was more of a transition. It was started and then brand was pulled off and new naming and all that. So it's kind of hard to say, did we actually start that with a new product launch? Do you call it a new company or not a new company? Right. And it gets a little murky. And that's frequently the way of things, how it's done. You start one thing and then you go, oh, that is not actually working. It's called a pivot. And we pivot to this and we pivot to that. And at some point you go, dang, we pivoted so far. That's just a whole new thing. Right. So we need a new entity structure. We need all these things redone and new accounts and new everything because, um, especially if you have new people involved in it. You yeah, know, that are that are different. Um, you know, maybe investors or whatever. So you uh-huh. have to set things up correctly, and there you go. It's a new company. And were you starting <laughs> companies while still with other companies, or was it you had a company, you either sold it off or left you, that, and then it's you usually would a one thing after the next. It's very really, s- yeah. Um, I wasn't very good at the parallel entrepreneurial yeah. path. Some people I know, um, Vic Ahmed is a great example of that. Mm-hmm. He does parallel companies. Um, Fantastically well. I don't yeah. know how he does it. I think it. I know Vic. 
Yeah, you yeah a lot of people should know Vic if they don't. He's huh. one of the most connected people you'll ever come across. I'll have to have yeah. him on the show. Yeah. Yeah, you should. Absolutely. So he launched Innovation Pavilion and uh-huh. uh, brought in Plug okay, and yeah. Play That's from Silicon be. Valley. Uh-huh. Went out to Silicon Valley, saw a really cool um, ecosystem that was growing there. And we didn't really have it here in Colorado much. And uh, what we did have was executive suites. And so he brought in Plug and Play and launched that concept here in the Denver metro area. Mm-hmm. So, um, And then Galvanize and other things sprouted up around it. Yeah. So industry and all those things, yeah. source and whatnot. Yeah, and we'll see. Like it's just where is that going to go? Build. Yeah, oh man, exactly. it's crazy. Have you seen the new galvanized building, by the way? Which one? Down like downtown, the downtown one, not off of um, not on uh, not on not on the, the river walk, but yeah, actually Pat like Street. it's oh Cherry Creek Road. right downtown downtown. I here. don't think I have. It's in, it's so cool. It's like really really cool. And it's, it's not Cherry galvanized. Creek. No, oh, not okay. Cherry Creek. There's one Cherry Creek. There's one Platt. near this Platt, in the, or there's one off of Platt over there, and then I can't think of the name of the one, but it's really cool. Like, the inside is awesome. They got beer on tap and, like, Sweet. coffee and all that cool stuff. Awesome. So your, your entrepreneurial ventures, what are your tips for people that want to start a company? Like, what? where's the first place they sh- sh- should start, you yeah. know? And if you're a product company, do you absolutely, this is where I'm kind of like my own, for my own knowledge, like, right. why does everyone go for funding in the beginning instead of selling product in the beginning, you know, testing concept? Because I, I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs and my peers that I talk to, like, I can't start a business. I can't raise money. Like, I can't get money going. I'm like, why do you go need sell money? something, bro. Right, right, right. So that always kind of like is, is something I don't really understand about the current entrepreneurial ecosystem i've heard a lot of different things so um one of the things i had the privilege of working with one of the groups accelerators was clean tech open mm-hmm. and in clean tech open we focus on companies that are uh, oftentimes making products and the problem and the reason why you need to have funding is because uh where are you going to develop your product you can only get so far in a lab or in your basement or wherever to manufacture a product to prove that you have a something worthy of selling that actually right. works and then um if you're even selling something that's a software product for example which is a little bit easier because it is less expensive um from a capital perspective you still have to pay your development team mm-hmm. right they're not going to work for free so where are you getting that money from to pay for the beginning parts of it. Mm-hmm. And that comes from generally your own savings. And so one of the first rules is make sure you've got it tucked away in a difficult to get out of account that takes a couple of days to transfer money out of literally um, your, you know, six months, a year worth of reserves so that and that shouldn't be touched. And then you have an extra account that is the account that you're going to use for funding your stuff. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of got to be buckets of money um, to get those money rules in place. Um, getting started in a product manufacturing, you, you can only sell so many pre-orders of a concept before somebody says, well, I got to see it. Right. And you won't get any kind of larger contract without that. So great ways to go about that when you have a product is actually to partner with companies who say, I really, really need that, and I'm willing to pay you for the R&D work. I don't want to bring that R&D work into my large company because that's a difficult, it's very bureaucratic, it's hard to get senior management to take a risk on an R&D kind of effort. But if you do the R&D, and I'm going to pay you, you know, some really inexpensive rate to do that, and if we like it, then we'll give you an order. And, um, you know, you're living on half pay to do that. And that, right. that's a way to get there. And you actually have a great channel partner to get started. So that mm-hmm. was one of the common ways that we saw that was successful. Right. Because it's really hard to go to a bank without two years worth of history on your finances to say, I am real. I can do this. I have demonstrated, you know, mm-hmm. my prowess in managing my money. So it's so more give effective me more money. to, instead of taking like a small business loan to start a product-based company, going to a channel partner or someone that has a literal need or want for that. Oh, what if it's, it's a consumer market though? It, there you go. It gets to be more difficult. <laughs> it gets a sticky, but though. somebody, you know, somebody is reselling to that mm-hmm. consumer market and right. so so your stuff can generally be piggybacked on, right? The coattails of somebody else's larger thing. I mean, mm-hmm. Aero Electronics is a fine example of that in right here in the yeah. marketplace. They have a bazillion different products and product lines. Yeah. And they actually have their own um 
funding group whose job it is to go out and look for really cool, innovative things that might um, dovetail into some of the things that they're doing mm-hmm. and supply some of the funding for that. And you know, but but it's all um, it, it really depends on who it is and what the kind of product is as to which thing you should do. SBA loans are a great idea um, because there's no equity being lost. You're good. In what uh, in what it is that you're you're doing, you know, mm-hmm. that's just a loan, and you're going to repay it, and that's that. So, yeah. so that if you can get an SBA loan, and there are definitely great institutions in our um, our area, Denver Metro area, that mm-hmm. that do a fantastic job of helping companies get those pu- push through. Uh-huh. And it's not every bank; you have to really dig for that. You have to like poke around to say who who actually is delivering on those. A lot of banks right. will say that they do, um, but they don't have a very high record of actually delivering. And right. so you Or their you, terms are probably like oh, well SBA's terms are SBA goofy. terms. Uh-huh. Um, technically. So but the point is um it's it's hard to close those loans, right. get them all done and packaged up properly. So you really have to find lenders who kind of specialize in that. Mm-hmm. So th- those can be good sources. But that's where you get to seed funding and friends and family is like one of the most common ways that businesses get started. Yeah. So, so what's the most common scenario that someone would come into your ecosystem with an idea or an actual product or yeah, and so it's all product Rockies, based like um, you're talking about Thai Rockies specifically yeah yeah Thai Rockies is product based startups you know it's not at all um, we have products that come through uh-huh. there um, but a lot of it is uh, software or Internet of Things kind mm-hmm. of thing uh, propositions um, some of them are service based companies uh, on a, really? on occasion yeah mm-hmm. and they're they're coming through Thai Rockies for a couple of different reasons one is um, we do provide a, an accelerator. So that's a learning environment where you come in at the front end, you do a little business plan, a pitch, you get in the door, pay a little money, but you get a ton of um, support from instructors that will teach you about mm-hmm. your finances and about your marketing and your sales and how do you put that pitch deck together that is investor ready? Whether you go to investor or not isn't really relevant. It's more about um, having things well defined and knowing who your target market is and what what to say to them that's going to resonate with that message. And then from there, within Thai Rockies, you have this whole community that you have a membership for an entire year where you get to come in and get more mentoring on an ongoing basis from people who've been there, done that. You right. know, and that's their that's in their heart. Or the charter members of Thai Rockies are all. Folks that have made it, um, they've, and some of them, multi-millions and billion dollar companies. So they've of made it Rockies. quite big, yes. Wow. Yeah, they're, you know, they're, and some of them are still in those companies. They sit on the board of directors for multiple companies. Uh-huh. So it's people like that, men and women. A lot of them are men. Um, and then these younger entrepreneurs get to pick the brains of those who have been before them and say, hey, how'd you do it? So... That's that's a huge advantage of people coming into Thai Rockies and the types of companies. It's really all across the board mm-hmm. um, in terms of yeah, where's the majority lay? Do you, do you I would say there is a, a heavier um, heavier influx of IT related things, mm-hmm. software types of things, big data, you know, types of yeah, uh, um, IoT, yeah, yeah Internet of Things, Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, uh, application so a lot you of gotta talk about the Bitcoin thing because what what different oh, types gonna... of companies could be a Bitcoin? Uh, I don't mean to yeah, that's di- a whole other yeah, subject. that's a whole other animal. And, and there's Julius somebody, is shaking his head and too. And so truly, don't do it. Somebody else that you should have come chat with you about that. Who yeah. is an expert in that and has delved into exactly what kind of businesses does uh-huh. it work for? Um, who would be a great uh, candidate? How does how how does it work? Um, yeah. Under what circumstances is it a right solution? Because it's right. not it's not for everybody, obviously. Right. So. And, and it's not just the cannabis industry either. You know, everybody right. goes, "Oh yeah, cannabis." Well, it is potentially a solution there, but that's not yeah. the only place. And there's there's so there's a whole other thing there. But um, I would say, you know, the applications and things of that nature are a heavy thing. But that is, I think, in my opinion, kind of represent based products, right? And, right? Yeah, yeah. So you know, I triage came out of um, Thai Rockies. There uh-huh. was a company that was at Innovation Pavilion. I, you know, and, and Thai Rockies was there to help support and mentor and all kinds of things. So things like that. Yeah. Um, uh, that is a very common thing, but it's also very prevalent in the overall Colorado marketplace. Mm-hmm. So I'm not really convinced that, uh, you know, if you look at the percentages overall, that it's all that different than the regular mix of right. what you're going to see right. across the board. Now, I will tell you with Clean Tech Open, um, that is much more manufacturing focused uh-huh. because um, although they have some companies that are also app based, um, you know, a company that 
um, provides data to the Forest Service, for example, about this land f- using satellite imagery and, oh, there's a fire over there, so you need to go there, but that land is way out there and nobody could even see it. Right. You know, so leveraging that, and then how do you apply that to your crops and how do you pr- you know apply it across the board to uh-huh. farmers and then to across the globe, you know, and right. uh, all different kinds of great things about what's the weather and What's the difference between stuff. the two? The Call, uh, and, clean tuck open. Yeah, and there's clean just, open. Um, it's just one of several different um, accelerators in the area. Okay. Um, clean, and both of them are global in mm-hmm. nature. Uh, Rocky Venture Club um, has their accelerator as well. Um, and there's actually a collaboration between Thai Rockies and Rocky Venture Club. All mm-hmm. of these are geared towards helping entrepreneurs to get it going, get it started, get in fast and intense. You know, let's get it done. Don't just sort of – one of the things we talk about is fail fast. Learn to fail fast. Yeah. Get there quickly because it's a lot less expensive. When you do mm-hmm. it quickly, the longer time you take, like money, off is, a money is getting spent. Yeah. Even if you're sitting still, money is still getting spent. You still have overhead costs and it's still right. costing. And people don't always think about that part of it. So it's really wise to fail fast. Fail fast. Get there in a hurry. Yeah. Figure it out. The uh-huh. other thing we talk about is um, you need to have a hundred. You need to have gotten to a hundred clients. You know, or hundred prospects to figure out. Um, as fast as you can get to that hundred number of a hundred, mm-hmm. then you're going to know whether you got the message right. You didn't get it. You got pre-orders coming in. You got mm-hmm. sales. You got you know, like you were talking about before. hundred clients, no matter what the hundred. Yeah, and this is product. Hundred is you're a great number. Based? Yeah. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. If you can get even if to it's an app, like a hundred people using an app. That's right. The first one hundred huh. is like the litmus test. Yeah. You know. You know. Okay. If I can get to a hundred. There's something. Yeah. Somebody's buying that. That's so interesting. Yeah. 10 is just like not it. Now, there are exceptions to that. Um, one of the companies I sit on the board of is an electric vehicle company. Wow. And uh, the clients, it's a very, there's, there's really giant companies out there mm-hmm. that buy the product as electric vehicle, vehicle transmission mm-hmm. and very few of them because they're just really giant. You right. Know? So it's hard to get to 100 with uh-huh. that. You can so have 100 Tesla, people. Tesla. Can you get Elon Musk in here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Not yet. Tesla's we'll working on his that. hands in your accelerator? Um, no, no. Their- heck no. They have done a fantastic job. And uh-huh. one of the things we talk about is that um, in amongst you know the, the charter members and stuff is uh, he's actually really fortunate to have the low price on gasoline because it has... Um, not stimulated the marketplace to put uh, electric vehicles out there that are commercial use. Yeah. Like the rest of the companies don't need it because their stuff's still getting bought yeah. as is without change. And so they have their representative vehicles that are in the electric vehicle components, which is great. I mean, we've huge leaps and bounds where we've come from. But, yeah, we like what seeing what all the different uh, lines are that – Elon Musk is coming through with. Yeah, he's doing I'm excited. Yeah. I want to get. I want to get electric just, vehicle soon, but yes. a cool, like a sexy looking electric All right. vehicle it has to be. Well, Teslas are pretty nice. Looking. They are. Yeah, yeah. that's a sweet ride. I've seen a few of them floating and they around are here. Crazy fast. And there's a, are there? Have you driven <laughs> yeah. one before? I have. Oh, do you have a Tesla? <laughs> I do not. <laughs> no, I, I drive a Mercedes Coupe. Oh, okay. It's a convertible. That's, that's so it's a pretty fun car. Fun car. <laughs> it's totally a fun car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That no was the 20th year wedding anniversary for my husband. Yeah. He's like, let's have fun. Here you go. Yeah. Your new cool, new toys. So um, this has been amazing, by the way. We have to have you on the show again at some point. I love but too. what is the next thing for you? What's, what's the main thing you're working towards right now? Um, I recently was asked to step in to take over presidency at Thai Rockies. And so awesome. that's a huge, yeah, thank you. Yeah, a huge deal for me. Um, I've been in that community since 2008 and I love um, working with the entrepreneurs. It's just a thing that even if, you know, as all my accounts get filled um, and I have all the time in the world, I can, you know, what do I get to choose to do? Mm-hmm. I constantly go back to that. I'm like in there with those entrepreneurs and I'm telling them, look, you got to do this. And you know, have you thought about that? And where are you going to go with this? And I want them all to be successful. You know, I want them all to make it. So, yeah. so that um, fires me up. And I, we have a great team um, at Thai Rockies and awesome members that are really into it. So that's a, a large part of my time. And then I work with um, three other companies that I'm kind of waiting to see which one is going to pop, you know. And mm-hmm. we, we've as got like product launches. And I might be full-time. Or... Yeah, I sit okay. in there. Some of them as advisory board, some board member, um, and um, also in a CMO role. So okay. set the strategies with uh, with the leadership team about where shall we go with this. And you know, it's on a retainer basis because they need a fractional CMO, not a full-time, because mm-hmm. uh, they are smaller companies. And we're waiting to see you know which one's going to go big. You, and which then, one do you yeah. think? 
I you know, know that it's all the, it's it's still out there. I'm waiting to see. Yeah, yeah. No, well, cool. can't really tell. We'll have to have, we'll have to we'll have, have to come back, back and tell you. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Once, once a year once from now, we'll all know. Yeah, yeah, you think so? Oh yeah. A year from now, I would think so. Awesome. Yep. One or the other or the other. And so the tie, you're, that's like a full. It's not a full time gig, but it, it's part time. But, but you're on the board. I mean, if you're going to be president, then that's, that's right. A, yeah, you do have to spend a fair amount of time, and yeah. we have a lot of stuff that um, we have. Some great programs that were launched mm-hmm. under prior uh, prior groups mm-hmm. that came before me. Um, and we want to make sure that they they were just launched like in the last year, some of them about three or four brand new ones. So we want to make sure they get their legs under them and really go and right. and take on a global um, aspect through the Thai Global Network. Right. So we want to help bring that out. So we're going to be having ThaiCon Northwest in August and bring in all kinds of people here and bring yeah. brilliant ideas and talk about a variety of different um, panel discussions and topics in the, in the area of entrepreneurship, especially in segmented um, sort of industry verticals around digital healthcare, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Where are the locations now in Colorado for, for people? For, for Thai? Thai? Is there one specific you know, um, location? We have offices down at Phantom, which mm-hmm. is in the AMG uh, Bank building. Okay. Um, which is, they have a, Phantom is actually a co-working space. Mm-hmm. It's a newer one. That's in really, Boulder. It right? is actually oh. DTC. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, that one's in DTC. Gotcha. Um, and we occasionally do some events up in uh, Denver, mm-hmm. uh, Denver metro area. But it's pretty much, um, Thai has remained in the south part. Like DTC, we've got that all wired up. We do a lot of things with South Metro uh, Mm -hmm. Economic Development um, Group and all the things in the south part of the town. Um, And we edge into Denver. Uh, But we've not really done a great job of reaching out into Boulder, even though Thai Global has stuff everywhere. Um, Thai Rockies is not, uh, and that's one of the things we keep talking about as an initiative. How can we reach out to people in Boulder and, you know, and in Longmont, and we're actually working with Innosphere to partner with them, which is out of Fort Collins. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be a place where our entrepreneurs would go to as a next step. That's a heavy-duty um, accelerator there, uh, and it's actually not an accelerator. It's more like an incubator. Yeah, You stay there for a year to two years. Gotcha. And so it's a different... And you do fantastic things what, What's there. the difference between an accelerator and Accelerator is condensed. It's usually weeks worth of training. Oh, okay. And um, it's very intense, and then you're presented into investors, whereas oh. an incubator, you actually have your company normally situated on site in mm-hmm. that company's incubator, and there's more, much more on a day-to-day basis of activity with mentors and mentoring mm-hmm. and Just investors more organic, coming in. Yes, more like a, yeah, yes, yes. Someone who's like, has something that's a little more established and they're exactly yeah looking to grow and so stuff their like qualifying that. criteria to get in there are really quite high really um, yeah and therefore what comes out the other end is highly successful good yeah that's incredible it is and so they're great it's a great place for investors and for companies that really want to that are growing you have to have already proven that you're not doing a startup startup there you've already gotten a lot of the basics out of the way and you have customers and you have um, you might be you know uh, doing drug uh, FDA uh, mm-hmm. approved I'm not doing drugs, drugs or something. Yeah, I'm not doing drugs either. <laughs> Other than my Gatorade, man. Right, Look at my right. Gatorade. <laughs> What do we put in there? So um, <laughs> you might have some other stuff uh, that requires, you know, or medical devices uh-huh. and things like that, which you wouldn't be, um, you wouldn't have clients yet because right. you can't get through the process. And so that's gotcha. a great place where you can go. For you incubation. Can have, right. Uh-huh. Exactly. So that kind of thing. And they yeah. have a lot of manufactured stuff. That's so interesting. I actually, I never even knew the difference between the two. There or you that go. They're Incubators are a little longer term, like year. Yeah. Year. Okay. Well, it's been amazing. I, I got to wrap this Thank thing you. up with Patrice. This was a incredible. Pleasure, Thank you so much for coming down. Yeah. How can people get into contact with you if what you said today resonated with them? Um, you know, you can look me up on Rocky rockies.tie.org. You can find me there, profile there, um, LinkedIn. You can look up Patrice Barber there. Um, I'm, yep, I'm out there. Uh, that's a probably two we're out, places. We're out here. You're yep, out Google there. Google me. Yeah, you might find some interesting articles about charter schools and other things that I've done in the, oh. in the community and news news press releases and such. But I didn't Google you. I got uh-oh. most all my dirt from LinkedIn, so I might have you'll to go see, Yeah, you'll see some interesting things. And there's a beautiful black woman named Patrice Barber, too, that uh-huh. um, oh. I think she does, like, Dance pole dancing or something. Uh huh. <laughs> and there's a dentist, Patrice. Okay. Barber. <laughs> Three of us. We're, we we hold the Patrice Barber space. If you Google. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. A pleasure so much. Yeah. Thank uh, you so much. Thanks, thanks guys thank for you. listening. Really appreciate it. That was Mile High Mentors. Be sure to go check us out on Stitcher, on SoundCloud. I'm talking way too loud right now. Let me just ease back from the microphone. Give us a follow on Instagram at Mile High Mentors. Love you guys. All take care. <laughs>